Hi, my name is Mark Guzdial, and uh, this last March, I was honored to be the recipient of the ACM SIGC Award for Outstanding Contributions to CS Education. And I gave the keynote on Friday, March 1st, and this is that keynote uh, recorded for, so that others can see it who weren't able to be there. Uh, the title of the talk is Computing Education as a Foundation for 21st Century Literacy. When I was a PhD student here at the University of Michigan, my advisor, Elliot Soloway, made all of his PhD students read this book, The Two Cultures by C.P. Snow. C.P. Snow, if you're not familiar with him, was a scientific advisor to the British government during World War II. And he wrote this book because he thought that it was concerning that military decisions were being made from either a scientific position or a humanitarian position but not both. And he felt that we had a split in Western culture between the humanities side and what we'd now call today the STEM side of the world, the science, technology, education, and math engineering and mathematics. Now, um, Snow blamed the liberal arts humanities folks for that, but that wasn't why Elliot had us read this book. Elliot had us read this book to think about who could use the knowledge that we have to offer in our educational opportunities, but might not even enter the room because they've already canceled it out, because they're no longer interested in that. How do we bridge the two cultures to make sure that everyone has access to these learning opportunities? So this is the mission statement of the ACM SIGC, Special Interest Group on Computer Science Education. Uh, excuse me, I'll read it at least this time to you. Our mission to provide a global forum for educators to discuss research and practice related to the learning and teaching of computing at all education levels. I think this is a really noble mission. I think that it's a really powerful mission. And much of my talk is gonna be focused on what does that mission really mean for us? So here's the story that I'll be talking about today. First, computer science was actually invented in order to teach everyone about everything. And then I'm gonna talk about computational thinking and about the more powerful idea of the imitation game. And finally, I'm gonna talk about how computing education will change on the way to achieving the goals for which computer science was created. It'll impact what we teach and it will impact how we teach it. So first let me offer you some definitions. My favorite definition of computer science is the one that uh, Perlis, Newell, and Simon wrote in uh, Science in 1967. The computer science is the study of computers and all the phenomena associated with them. Now, sometimes when I give that definition, computer scientists sort of choke a little bit. That's a little too broad for them. So I'll try to defend that definition, but I also, we can introduce the definition of computing, which is generally considered to be a big umbrella over computer science and computer engineering and software engineering and information systems and information technology. I like the definition of computing that, that Peter Denning wrote about um, in the, the report, The Future of Computing, in the ninth, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, that computing is computer science facing outward, that the really interesting ideas in computer science are going to come from applying computer science to other problems, that that's computing. Finally, I'm gonna talk a good bit about the idea of what is programming. And for me, it's reading and writing a notation of computing, a specification of a computer's process. And I'm gonna to try to defend that definition as we go along. So this is George Forsyth, who many of you probably have never met before or never seen a picture of, but he's actually the inventor of the term computer science. He first published it in 1961 in, of all places, the Journal of Engineering Education. Forsyth invented computer science, or at least the term computer science, because he saw it as one of the most valuable tools in a STEM education. In 1968, he wrote about the, the powerful mental tools that we might teach students, that the most powerful of these is natural language and then mathematics, but then a new important skill was computer science, that it was a way of, of thinking, that it was a, invented to be a tool for learning everything else. In 1961, MIT Sloan School hosted a symposium on computers and the world of the future. It was an amazing event. It was a who's who of people who did computer science at the time. People like Gene Amdahl and John McCarthy and Grace Hopper, um, just tons of um, amazing folks. This book here uh, was published in 1962 by Martin Greenberger. It's a transcript of all of the lectures and all the discussants comments. It's pretty amazing, uh, totally out of print. This is literally a picture of my copy that I I still have. Um, 
One of the chapters was by Alan J. Perlis. He was the lecturer. His discussants were uh, Peter Elias, who was the head of electrical engineering at MIT at the time, and J.C.R. Licklider, who, if you're not familiar with Licklider, whether you think that Vint Cerf or Al Gore is the father of the internet, it's pretty clear J.C.R. Licklider is the grandfather of the internet. He was the guy, he, he had the idea. And when he was at DARPA, he funded the original nodes for the internet. So Perlis, who uh, was the first ACM Turing Award winner, um, the Turing Award is sort of computer science's version of the Nobel Prize. Uh, Perlis started the computer science departments at Yale and Carnegie Tech, later to become Carnegie Mellon University. So Perlis spoke on why computer science was a should be a requirement for all students on all campuses that he thought that it, was a it should be a requirement, part of a general education requirement, for everyone to learn how to program. This was his chapter, The Computer in the University. And his argument was that um, computer science is the study of process. And he contrasted this with calculus. Calculus is the study of rates. And generally, we think students should learn some calculus at a university as part of their general education. Perlis said rates are really important to lots of people, but process is important to everybody. And what's really powerful about computers is that it automates process. And so it allows us to explore questions that we never thought of before and to reinterpret things that we understood previously in new ways. So computer science is really important because it offers us a new way of understanding something which is important to us, process. Now, when we think about offering computer science to everybody, this is the, the name which most people first think of, Seymour Papert who, with Wally Furzig, who's pictured here, a picture that Gary Steger provided me. Gary is on the right side of the picture. Wally Furzig's on the left. Cynthia Solomon's in the middle. Wally, with Seymour, developed Logo. Seymour was a, um, a consultant to Wally's project at BBN Labs. Cynthia Solomon worked with Seymour on the development of the Logo curriculum and of Turtles. So Logo was invented to be a tool for students to think about thinking. Seymour Papert claimed that children can learn to program, and learning to program can affect the way that they learn everything else. Much of the same as what we just heard Alan Perlis talk about. Now, the way that I first became aware of this whole idea of how do we teach computer science to everybody and why should we teach computer science to everybody was through this paper, Personal Dynamic Media, by Alan Kay and Adele Goldberg. It came out in 1977. I first found this paper in 1982, and literally this paper changed my life. I read this paper and, and was entranced by their vision of the computer as a tool for thinking, that it could enhance the way that people think. The, the big screen on, uh, on the left, it isn't a version of Windows. It's actually the first screenshot that we have of the WIMP interface, that we have windows and icons and windows that overlap, um, and we have a mouse pointing device and we have pop-up menus. This was in um, the Xerox Smalltalk of the 1970s. And the other two representations are things that uh, Alan and Adele put into their paper about the wide range of notations that a computer could provide. Alan wrote, computer literacy is a contact with the activity deep enough to make the computational equivalent of reading and writing fluent and enjoyable. Their idea was that the computer would become a new way of expressing thought, a new kind of medium that was particularly powerful because it could be any other previous medium. It could be music, it could be pictures, it could be animations, it could be movies, but what's more is it could be interactive. And the idea was that we could use the computer to be this new kind of a medium. Andy DeSessa invented the idea of computational literacy, this idea of that we should be able to use, that we should teach everyone computing the way that they develop textual literacy, the ability to do language, the way they develop numeric literacy, um, the way that we know how to deal with arithmetic and mathematics. Um, he, with Hal Abelson, wrote the book Turtle Geometry about the very powerful kinds of ideas that you can explore with what we thought was a simple thing, um, Seymour's logo turtle. The images in the middle are from Boxer. It's the programming environment that uh, DeSessa and his students developed to answer the question, if you really wanted kids to engage with computational literacy, what should the environment look like? So he and his students, Andy and his students, have done what I think are the most, some of the most important work in understanding what does it mean to have computational literacy. So let me tell you one of the stories that one of his students, Bruce Sharon, tells. 
this formula in front of you, probably many of you have seen it before in a physics class that you're probably still trying to forget. It's describing how the current position x is based on the initial position x0 plus velocity times time plus 1 half uh, acceleration times time squared. This is a really powerful notation that we use in physics because it describes balance. If I give you all but one of those, uh, those variables, you can figure out the other one, and the two sides balance, balance out. Bruce Sharon found that when he teaches students with this equation versus teaching them with a code representation, they learn different things. This is the same thing, but in terms of box or code. So the box in the middle is what happens at every tick of the clock. We're going to change the veloci velocity into what vol the velocity plus the acceleration. We're going to change the position to be the position plus the velocity. We're going to make the little dot on the left-hand side drop according to the velocity and then create a dot on the screen and that creates the falling object representation. Bruce found that when he had students learn with code, the same idea rather than with equations, they developed a causal model, a temporal model about what was going on. I did some similar work in my dissertation where I had students build these kinds of, of simulations. And at the end of the class, I took students aside and said, you're at the top of a two-story building and you drop a rock. How long is it going to take to reach the ground? And here's what one of the students said. You don't have to read this whole thing. Scan it, and the first thing you see is that you don't see the letters X, A, T, and V showing up anywhere. The student isn't thinking in terms of the variables. And as you look at what he's saying, he talks about what happens in the first second, and then what happens in the second second. And they realize, oh no, it's already gone too far. It'll hit the ground around 1.5 seconds. And then you realize this kid's running that tick loop in his head. He's going second by second. He's simulating what's happening as the rock is falling. That's a different model. He's not trying to solve an equation. He's actually got a dynamic model about what's going on when, our, when the rock is falling. And this is this powerful idea, computation as a literacy. The computing is a causal specification of process that can be automated, the master simulator. Um, some of you may have seen the movie The Imitation Game about Alan Turing. The movie doesn't really get into this, but alludes to the one of the powerful ideas of the universal Turing machine. That a universal Turing machine can simulate anything else. That it can imitate anything else. That's the really powerful part about computing. That it can be other subjects. That it can affect the way that students learn everything else. And the goal is enjoyable fluency. And quite literally, this is what computer science was created for. Allen said in 1991 that the computer is the greatest piano ever invented, for it is the master carrier of representations of every kind. The heart of computing is building a dynamic model of an idea through simulation. The computer can simulate other subjects, other ideas, and that's what's the powerful thing that we can use in teaching with and for computing. So let me again return to that uh, the mission of the ACM SIGC. Explicitly in the mission is that we want to reach all education levels. This idea of teaching computer science for all, it's something that we own. So let's think about where we are so far in my, the, the history that I'm laying out for you. In 1961, uh, George Forsyth used the term computer science for the first time in the Journal of Engineering Education. Alan Perlis made the argument that this computer science stuff, it's for everybody. In 67, Forsyth made the argument that it's the third leg of literacy, that we want kids to be able to be fluent in their, in their natural language and textual language. We want kids to be fluent in mathematics. But this computational stuff, this is also really important. In 1968 was the first computer science curriculum, and it's when SIGSI, the Special Interest Group in Computer Science Education, was first formed. So now here we are at 2019. It's the 50th anniversary of SIGSI. And it's reasonable to ask, have we achieved Alan Perlis's vision? Do we have computational literacy for all?